This is The Philosophical Angle, and I'm your host, Chris Angle. Thanks for joining us. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Economic Equations of... I'm sorry, The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist and discussant, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MA from Tufts, an MBA from Wharton. He's retired from the investment banking industry, and he's now a venture capitalist. Welcome, Rick. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which it is being used. This week, we're going to discuss the topic of the failure of the public school system. And so let's start. We need, it recently in the news, <coughs> we've heard that the New York public school system is graduating a, about 80% of its class unable to pass basic literary function tests and are really 80% illiterate. But they're not alone. There are others across the nation that have the same problem. Highland Park. Highland Park Mission is graduating is, is, is said to be 90% illiterate upon graduation. The public school system, it's a disaster. It's of course, it's made up of teachers and curriculum which are producing a national fail rate of somewhere between 12 and 15% statewide throughout the nation, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics. 10 to 15 percent on average, except for certain uh, particularly high rates, lack the basic literary skills, as they put it, in their uh, statistics. In fact, at Highland Park in Michigan, the situation is so bad that the ACLU has started a lawsuit. Its basis of that is that the, is, is, is in the Michigan Constitution, where it states the state shall maintain and support a system of public education. Well, obviously, if you have a graduating class who's 90% who's illiterate, obviously you're not maintaining a system of support that you could call a school system, because it's a total failure. And so their point is well taken. But the facet, what makes this, what makes public school systems throughout the nation really, imagine 12 to 15 percent of the graduating class can't read, can't have basic l literary skills to read and write? Well, public school system has one facet that we need to point out. It's a monopoly. Subst uh, su uh, supported by forced taxation for the idea of education for, the, for all. Obviously, some people can't for afford private education. So the thought is, well, we'll tax everybody, create a school system, and provide education. No tuition, so everybody can enter. There's a high demand, obviously, for education. Everybody wants their children to be educated. But yet it produces a tremendously low quality, whereas private schools also have high demand, obviously, just like uh, public education. There's a high demand for it. But it has high tuition, so there's a high cost. Not everybody can go but it produces high quality. So, what should we do? 
We mentioned taxes support public schools. And it is the supplier of the educational product for most of the population. And it sets its own price, which is a very low tuition rate. In fact, it's just it's taxed to the, by the general public. It is a virtual monopoly. But the problem with a, with a monopoly, in this case a virtual monopoly, it gives itself a high priority to, its, to itself as a supplier of its product. But that's the way of nature. You wake up in the morning and the first thing you think about yourself, getting out of bed. If you're a supplier and you make a product, you think of yourself first, how much does it cost me? How much profit do I want? And that's natural. The seller is always higher, that is the ask, is always higher than the bid. If it were other, otherwise, life would not be able to exist. <coughs> Hence, the seller of the product always starts with a higher price than the buyer who, who demands, who seeks a product, we'll call it the bid. And, the sell, and thus the seller always sets the opening price. Naturally, the seller thinks of himself first and establishes a priority and attaches that priority to his supply, and then, but the demand also will come around and attach its priority to counterbalance that supply and make its bid. But in a monopoly, this situation, that is the priority of the demand of the bid side, is disenabled because there's only one supplier. So the, pro the preponderance of the priority is set on the supply. So we have a monopoly, in this case a school, but it can apply to any company, any entity that produces a product. In this case, it's a school priority, and it's it has a good demand out there for its educational product. So it's plentiful, it's high. But the school has a low priority for the for the for the bid, for those who are demanding the product. Why? Because it's the only game in town. The school's priority of the supply is a monopoly, therefore not plentiful. Only game in town. Priority, high. Students and parents' priority, on the other hand, it wants that high education, it wants a good education, demand is high, and its priority is high. Let's take a look at the non-monopolistic situation in which if there were schools, other schools that can compete with, say, Highland Park, or in New York City, or in any educational situation, or really in edu co any company, any entity that has a product. The demand of the product is, of course, high in, for the, uh, for the, in the for the demand of the educational product. But the supply also then, if they're in a non-monopoly situation where you have competition, supply becomes plentiful. And so its self-priority of the supply becomes less because it must become below the priority of the other suppliers in order to exist because competition is inimical to the product's health, to the supplier's health.
so he must compete. So he must lower his priorities, price it below the other suppliers. But there's a curious thing that happens when he does that. When he lowers his priority, there's a capacity left over for, for the rest of that initial priority. And this leftover capacity to make a priority, which is a piece of knowledge, goes over to the demand side. He starts to think of the other side, of those who are demanding his product, who want to buy his product. And what happens? When you start to think of the other side and how important they are in your consideration of your existence, quality improvement begins to happen. So, solution, we have to make public school monopolies into a non-monopoly situation in order to get the teachers and the curriculum and the administration to lessen their priority thinking of themselves and start to make their priority over to the demand side, to the student and parent side, to, and that will in initially and essentially and naturally allow for quality improvement. So let's go over to Rick and see what he has to say about the failure of the public school system and, and how shall we rectify and improve the situation in America. Rick? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I guess the first thing I'd note is uh, there are models globally for lower cost educational systems that uh, have a better outcome. Uh, a lot of them are in Asia, but also places like Finland and, and what have you. These are school systems that, public school systems that regularly produce students that score much higher than uh, American students uh, in a whole raft of uh, exams, but particularly in, in math and science. Uh, generally, uh, these systems uh, cost less, um, uh, both um, relative to the United States and in terms of how they use their resources um, rather more efficiently, uh, less on administration, more on actual teaching and teachers. Um, and they're more prone to discipline. Uh, as the U.S. system used to be. So disciplinary action vis-a-vis uh, -vis students that misbehave is, is, is harsher. Uh, and they tend to be in school, school for longer periods of time. Um, there are actually more hours of teaching uh, and more homework in general than you find in the U.S. system. And there's also, on average, less attention paid to handicapped, uh, underperforming students, students that don't speak English. Uh, that kind of um, educational support is, is uh, much less generally in the system. So it's not as if uh, you know, the educational system, public educational system in the United States can't find examples of systems that have a better outcome, at least in terms of test results. But uh, this doesn't seem to get discussed much in the, certainly in political or public circles here. It's kind of an embarrassment that's shunted to the side uh, that no one wants to talk about. The, you know, on the liberal side, uh, there tends to be simply talk of more spending. Uh, we don't spend enough. Uh, even though we're spending, I don't know, 50% more in real terms than we did in the 70s on the public educational stu uh, system per student, yet with lower test scores. Um, you know, the whole system is often uh, 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 complained of by parents as being dumbed down. Uh, and that, that there's evidence of that across uh, many areas in the United States. Uh, so. I guess one of the first steps I would take is the United States needs to benchmark its public educational 
system in terms of content, in terms of disciplinary um, format, in terms of hours spent in school, in terms of homework workload against the best systems uh, elsewhere in the world. You know, the best systems well, elsewhere in the world are, are, are probably which systems? Well, in terms of testing results, uh, Singapore, I guess, is arguably the best out there. Uh, amongst the other top systems are China's. And again, it costs a fraction of what the U.S. does. Korea has a very, a very strong system. Japan, uh, Finland, uh, and there are a number, and there are several other European countries, frankly, many of them in Scandinavia, are, are also strong in terms of test results. What makes them strong? Well, in the case of the Asian systems, um, there's the disciplinary environments much harsher. Uh, students are not allowed to disobey. Uh, students are under pressure also from their parents to perform well. Not that every single student does, but on average they, they do, much, uh, much more so than in the United States. Uh, homework loads are, are, are greater and students are expected to perform them. Uh, class time is greater, number of days in school on average is greater. Um, and the, uh, the programs um, for handicapped students or underperforming students are minimal, frankly. So not much resource is spent on underperforming students. It's rather spent on getting the average student to perform better at peak levels. That's the focus. What do you think of the, uh, the possibility, because you, 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 you mentioned countries. Now, in education here in America, it's really local education, uh, sometimes state education, but rarely federal education on the on the primary and secondary uh, levels. Do we need to uh, take that where it is now, that is at the local and state level, and make it a federal uh, situation where the feds come in and, and uh, control the, uh, the school system? Is, is that, would that improve it? Uh. I think there's there's a case to be made for promoting the use of, of standardized exams, and that already, already exists in the United States, the SAT uh, and other similar tests being a leading example of that. Uh, but that's as far, that, that's where the, the national government or a national organization, the SAT is not run by the government, but a national standardized series of tests are a very useful method for benchmarking how the local systems perform. That doesn't mean, one of the strengths of the United States is we have this federal system where there can be experimentation at the local level. So uh, states that have taken on more charter schools and we're still seeing the results of how those schools are performing will either perform better or worse than states that have so far resisted uh, having charter schools. Um, so I don't think, and, and bear in mind that we used to perform better uh, years ago for less cost per student, and that was under a non-nationalized system. So it's not as if it can't work and it hasn't worked here in the past. What about, uh, what about uh, taking the money that the money public schools that. get or, and giving it a, uh, and replacing it with a voucher system? They can, parents can take the money that a school system has to its, uh, uh, in, its, uh, in its possession, for example. I know that typically in many instances, um, Students are uh, the amount of money spent per student is ten, eleven, even twelve, thirteen thousand dollars per student, and yet you get the product becomes is deficient. 
what about a to take that money per in, spent per individual give everybody a voucher let them either send it to the public school or a private school or uh, a uh, I think there are some uh, of these new schools that are charter schools and allow choice to come into the factor to obliterate the monopoly system that pervades throughout the United throughout the, the primary and secondary school system. How would you feel about well, I this? Think, yeah, I think that's essential. Um, we, we have a peculiarly strong union culture in the educational system here in the United States. Um, and that's, as you mentioned, a, a, a huge source of distortion. Not that they don't have teachers unions in other countries, but the degree to which the union has imposed um, requirements, uh, often dilutive requirements on teachers and how much uh, effort they put in and how much they're paid for that, and the, the degree to which the federal government has actually foisted upon states and local educational systems uh, requirements to educate uh, non-English speakers, uh, sometimes in their own language, handicapped persons. These kinds of federal mandates have diluted uh, precious resources uh, and tried to, and essentially put many school systems in a kind of regulatory straitjacket. So the fact that you have the opportunity in, in uh, so many um, school systems now to introduce vouchers uh, and make use of charter schools uh, can't accept, uh, it can't but, uh, excuse me, uh, improve uh, competition and highlight the poor performance of schools that aren't measuring up to uh, the test score standards set by places like Singapore. So I think, you know, part of it is a is a, a communications effort so that um, schools that are performing badly are shown an alternative. The alternative works, that being perhaps a charter school, and you know, over time, more more parents uh, who are interested in their children's welfare will will send their students to the charter schools. The public schools that fail will will ultimately be defunded, and uh, you know, there's scope for improvement. One other area where I see a lot of hope, actually, is in online learning. You've got Stanford University now offering a high school degree almost entirely online. Okay. Uh, these kinds of uh, you know, disruptive technologies could potentially allow students to bypass a, a big chunk of the failing public educational system. Do you have any idea of the cost of that uh, Stanford program? I looked at it once. It's um, it's not cheap, um, but from memory, it was uh, certainly not as expensive as, as something like uh, Choate or, or Hotchkiss, which gotcha. you know, they run fifty thousand dollars a year. So it it, it um, from memory, it was um, perhaps in the ten thousand dollar range. So not that much different from what the per head cost. Well, that would place a, a it in a, uh, is. that would place it well into the budget of a voucher system that these school systems uh, could uh, uh, could initiate uh, without costing the taxpayer any more money. In fact, uh, having the taxpayer pay less and get a higher quality of product in the end. Uh, and this would be, uh, of course, because th one of the objections, of course, to moving to a voucher system would be that there isn't enough supply of the product, but with online systems, there certainly would be. Um, and, uh, and the void would soon be filled by all sorts of, uh, of uh, private schools, which rarely, which, which are and throughout the history of the United States, the the progenitor of of, of, of great learning, and they've become great learning centers, and become quite famous. And so, 
I think the, the real future, should the United States want to improve the learning centers for primary and secondary education, is through the voucher system to allow private schools to compete with the public schools. Rick, last word. We've got uh, yeah, about 30 agreed. seconds. Uh, Agreed. I'd have to check the numbers again on Stanford. I looked at, at that a few years ago. Uh, but, you know, my son's enrolled in the Johns Hopkins program, and those costs, those uh, courses, which are, many of which are offered online, are, you know, roughly $1,200, $1,500 uh, apiece. So, you know, add those up. These, you know, these are semester courses, and it, it's not that far off. Uh, what the average public school pays for a high school education. Okay. That's about all the time we have for the Philosophical Angle this week. I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank Rick for joining us. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.